and Dave Brown. Sure. Hello. Glad to be here. So I'm Dave Brown. I was the guy that got caught in the avalanche. Several people here helped uh, pull me out. Thank goodness. Let's see. Point that way? What if I just don't? The pointer? Point at you? The lead in. Okay, Christmas Eve. Uh, just a plan, just planned to go for a quick tour. Um, went up with two buddies. Um, they're just a party of three. Each of us had a lot of backcountry experience. Got up to Alta Central around 8.30 and started hiking um, with kind of a plan to be back at about 11.30 or so. Um, clear skies, nice and cool, moderate temps, typical early season snowpack. I'd been out quite a bit earlier that year. Um, depth hoar in the base, weak faceted layers with new snow on top. This is, it had snowed about 48 hours prior, um, two feet of dense, moist snow. We had a kind of west wind event. So, there's the snow profile, if you guys want to look at that. Um, more or less, you can see what's, what's going on there in the typical, what seems to be kind of typical early season Utah snowpack these days. Um, so we climbed up flag, descended one run off of Emma Ridge. Actually, the background, that was my last run last year. It was a good run. Um, then we climbed up um, the Emma Foreskin track to the top of Silver Fork and West Bowl. I tend to be a little chatty, so I ran into some friends that I knew and uh, started talking about Christmas and yada, 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 that kind of stuff. And meanwhile, my other friends were kind of stomping around, checking stuff out. Um, and they were, while they were checking out the top of Jaws, I wasn't honestly paying attention to what they were doing. And they kind of skied down to the entry of Jaws. And I'm like, oh, got to go. See you later. Ripped off my skins and then proceeded down to the entry. Um, so this is kind of some photos taken from uh, Bruce's report. Um, we did have a discussion prior to. Um, I myself brought up a point saying, you know, really? Jaws today? Really? And I uh, was more or less kind of convinced from my partners. They had, you know, stomped on it at the top, kind of said, you know, historically it seemed like this is, you know, they had some, some counterpoints basically. Um, it did, you know, it did look like it had some Sestrugi type stuff. It did, you know, there was a decent chance that, okay, maybe it had settled out, maybe it was okay. So um, we agreed to go for it. And the uh, question was asked, do you want to, you know, you want to go first? I said, no, <laughs> I don't want to go first. I'll go last because last is safest. Perception of risk. So let's see. So let me go here. So this is kind of, I don't know if we have the pointer, but you can see the slide path. This is just Google Earth. And so the first gear, which is kind of the, the slide there, I don't know if, yeah, there we go. Pointer. I have so much technology on me. I have a lot. Skier one, this one. So we were kind of at a safe spot, and he skied across, did a big ski cut, and then went back, and then at that point, skied it. He was fine, made it all the way down to the bottom, no problem. Um, second guy, second skier, went down, followed that same path, skied it, and as he was skiing it, he was kind of in the choke. Um, for those of you that know, Jaws is kind of like hourglass shape. So I actually proceeded from the safe spot when he started getting out of view um, onto, the, onto the slope so I could keep my eyes on him. So I was about right there. And then as I got out to that point, everything above released. Just big shotgun crack. I had a moment to look up, see just big giant boulders of snow coming at me. Um, and, uh, you know, game on pretty much. So let's see, let me, so how about, 
how do I hit the uh, video clip here? Do a little, there you go. This is not it. <laughs> this should be Bruce's avalanche report, but it could just be some country music too. Let's see. Yes? No? Yes? Well, try this, try this hyperlink. Literally the night before, see, yeah, see if that works. This is, this is not, that's the music to the clip, but that's not actually the video. Maybe it won't work. That's that awesome lead-in music every time that the forecast center has like their well, doesn't look like it's going to work. Give it one more shot. I think, I, unless... Well, we can hear the audio. Audio might work. Let's just go with the audio. It's pretty good. There we go. Right of a steer triggered avalanche uh, today. So the person came in, there was a third person skiing this slope, came in right there and uh, triggered the avalanche. It broke to the ground on the weak facet of snow near the ground and broke out about 50 to 70 feet wide and went down through this steep, rocky couloir through the little trees down there, it was buried at the bottom, completely buried, and uh, with a broken leg, a uh, broken tip, fib fracture. So very lucky, but as you can see, it's a very high consequence, steep avalanche path that faces north. And uh, it was uh, very lucky. Here I am standing on the bent surface of uh, Jaws, the avalanche that the skier triggered in days for it today came in right over there uh, from the side, treated it from the side, and it broke out up above him, and then washed him all the way down a steep, narrow couloir, and completely buried him at the bottom. So you can see it's a very steep, high-consequence avalanche path. It broke all the way across, maybe about 100 feet wide, up to three feet deep over there, about two feet deep where I am here. So this is the snow pad. And we have all the facets snow down by the ground. And then this is the top horizon of the facet of snow. And you can see this layer. This is the bed so it's just really broken. So it collapsed this layer right here. And then this is all, it appears to be this, um, all the, the new snow that's been on the ground for the past couple of weeks. And then it's hard to tell how much of this is the new windblown snow, the new snow that came down just uh, a couple of days ago. Um, two days ago and yesterday. So uh, that's what broke on the great week, fast and shivery snow down near the ground. Um, it's typical to, to break these things in a shallow area when they break across in the thicker areas. But uh, very uh, lucky to be alive. Uh, this is a very high consequence avalanche path as you can see. I am one lucky fucker. <laughs> okay, we can go back to the uh, slideshow. All right. So I don't think I'll play this clip, but literally, just ironically, five minutes really left in the whole thing. No, for you. Oh, for me? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so um, literally the night before i just happened to be noodling around on the internet and watched kimbro's kind of how to survive an avalanche i kid you not just like the night before and uh so it was right in the front of my head so what was i thinking well i've i've been a boater for a while kind of essentially you know it's not the best analogy but when you flip your boat um like a raft especially 
you go from like, oh, everything's cool to like, oh shit, really fast. So you just deal. You don't have really time to think about too many other things. So yelled avalanche. Um, fortunately, the guy who was skiing right uh, below me, he heard and he was able to get out of the way, which was quite fortunate. Um, just got kind of supermanned by all the debris, thrust forward through my poles, and then just started going for the ride. Um, pretty soon thereafter, uh, just took a big hit. You know, I didn't know where it was on my body, just a big, giant, uh, slamming feeling. And then, you know, I could tell that I was riding the avalanche. I wasn't getting chundered, I wasn't getting Maytag. I was more or less just riding it. And I was just, it, it felt like I was body surfing, but upside down. And I was just trying to, in my mind, think of being like a big particle in like a sediment experiment. So I was just trying to stay big. Um, and then I could tell I was in the apron and I was just gonna wait for it. I knew, you know, okay, it's gonna slow down, waiting for it, waiting for it. And then as soon as it came to a stop, um, I thrust my hand over my head and, um, you know, opened my eyes for a second and realized I was totally buried and just shut my eyes instantly and then just told myself, okay, relax, and just more or less passed out. Now I pass the baton to Mike. Thanks. Do you want to give me that thing too? Oh, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Dave. So I'm Mike Hales. Um, I was one of many people that worked on the, the rescue of Dave um, uh, as a result of this avalanche. And so I'm going to tell a little, just kind of tell the story of, of what happened and then see if at the end I can kind of pull together uh, a little thread of, of lessons learned, uh, things that we can do uh, as professionals and as backcountry skiers to, you know, avoid this in the future and also to respond to it well. Um, at the end of the day, Dave was really, really lucky um, because he's up here today, he's walking around, he's riding his bike, he's doing, you know, back to, to doing things that he loved, but, you know, with a, a messed up leg with some screws and a pin and, and stuff in it. So he was lucky, but there was also huge consequences that were, that were negative. Um, let's see here. There we go. So um, what I want to do is talk about that luck a little bit. And uh, I'm going to you know, tell the story and, and identify some of the things that really went well. Uh, and then see if we can identify some ways to make it um, so that luck doesn't play such a big factor, right? Because luck cuts both ways. Uh, Dave was lucky. Sometimes people are unlucky as well. And if we put our our life and our safety in the hands of luck, um, you know, th that's only going to work for a small fraction of us. The, the, other, the, the other side of it is someone will give it, be unlucky and, and they'll be dead. So we were skiing that day uh, in Days Fork as well. It was a group, uh, I think there was actually six of us in our group, so we were a, a larger group than Dave. Um, and we were skiing the, the run called Two Dogs, which is at the kind of the very top of Days Fork where you can drop in. We started at Alta as well, and it skinned up the Flagstaff Skinner. Um, we were also kind of a, a group of old guy skiers. Um, there, you know, there was a good deal of experience in our group. Um, I've actually participated in a rescue before this, and so. Um, my decision-making process was, was influenced by that, by my previous experience. And, and we were not going to ski Jaws that day. Uh, we were already a little worried, worried enough to, um, to kind of draw our own line. And, and so we were skiing uh, what we felt like was a conservative line um, and, and skinning back out it and, and had committed to ourselves to not, not go any steeper. Um, so we had just skied uh, one of several runs there and we're at the bottom of the run. And I happened to be the one that skied first. Uh, and so I was at the bottom and I had transitioned first as well. So I had skinned up um, 
and was waiting for my friends to, to skin up as well to start uh, heading back out. We heard a shout and some noise and looked down canyon to the, the Jaws path um, and actually saw snow in motion. And I saw what m may have been Dave or may not have been, but what looked like someone in it. And so since I was ready to go, I was able to immediately basically start running or skinning as fast as I could down the bottom of the drainage towards the bottom of Jaws. Um, as we approached the, um, the base, um, there was uh, the other two members of his party that were there, and, and so we knew that someone was buried. So I was able to uh, pull out my beacon, go into search mode, and very quickly um, able to zero in on, on Dave's signal. So one of his uh, party members had started the beacon search from above, and I had started from below. We basically um, converged together on the burial site almost simultaneously. Uh, and this was within probably just um, a couple of minutes, two, maybe three minutes um, from when the, uh, he was buried. So it was a very quick beacon search. Um, we both dropped down. Uh, his partner, Gary, started basically digging with his hands. Um, I pulled out my pack, put together a shovel, handed it to Gary, grabbed his pack, put together his shovel, then started to dig. So two of us were there digging um, you know, within just a couple of minutes, which was um, really important. In that time, um, the other party members started to, um, to filter down and um, were able to start putting together shovels as well and, and were able to kind of get into the, uh, the recovery as well. So it, it didn't take long to make contact. We uh, came on his hand first, was able to follow out down to his, uh, to his head and, and face. Um, as we uncovered his face, Dave was um, blue already and not breathing. And uh, so um, quickly opened his mouth and uh, swept his mouth with my finger, got a bunch of snow out with it, and uh, immediately he kind of sputtered and, and spontaneously started breathing again, which was a huge relief to us. Because um, we knew, it, you know, the, the very worst case scenario wa wasn't going to happen. You know, at least he was alive and was now breathing again. Um, somewhere in this time, um, as more people um, kind of approached, one of my party members was able to get on the phone. Uh, and one of the really you know, lucky aspects of the recovery was that there was cell service at the bottom of that drainage, which, um, I mean, I can't even get cell service in my house half the time, so having cell service at, in the bottom of Day's Fork was a really lucky thing at the time. Um, and so, so anyway, we, we were continuing to dig while the other members in the party started to communicate with rescue services, um, were able to get more people involved, started digging down, just kind of followed his body down. Um, as we moved down his body, we got to where the leg should have been going straight, and instead it made a turn the wrong direction, and that was uh, disheartening. Made another turn another wrong direction, and that was even more disheartening as we saw that um, his tele ski was still attached, and he had a severely broken compound tib-fib fracture with the bone sticking out over the top of the ski boot. Um, we, we dug a really big hole. Um, it's amazing. So I, I've, like I said, this is my second time in participating in a, in a rescue, and the same thing happened in that it blows me away how freaking big the hole is when you finally get down deep enough to, to get someone um, on someone's feet. Um, we're able to basically get down, reposition him. Um, the nice thing about having a bunch of rescuers was we had a bunch of puffy coats, and so uh, I was in the bottom of the hole, got in with Dave, basically, and started kind of, um, well, he started getting a little feisty, too, so I kind of had the dual job of trying to hold his arms down and restrain him a little while we put his leg in traction. Um, we used some ski pole sections and some volet straps to make a splint and put traction on his leg. And, uh, and then tried to kind of hold him and keep him warm uh, with puffy coats and, and body heat as we coordinated the, the rest of the, um, the rescue. Um, the first place that we called was Alta Central. Um, it was our understanding that that was the place to call in, in the event of an avalanche. I think that was something that was um, 
given as part of the uh, avalanche forecast, um, you know, in the event of an avalanche call, whatever number, so we can report it. Um, we then had to call 911 as well um, to start to coordinate uh, getting a helicopter. Um, this was one of the things that I'm going to kind of come back to and talk about, you know, some some possible area of improvement, having to talk to two different people and, and explain where you are and all those things definitely um, takes time and, and I think is an area that can be streamlined. And I know that uh, the forecast center and, and um, the sheriff uh, or the uh, unified police has got some protocol there. And so having that communicated effectively to everyone through the forecast center um, is probably the, the best way. So we all know where to call and that it probably should just be one place. Uh, so they were, we were able to tell them exactly where we were and the helicopter was able to um, come get us. There's a couple of things that we learned with the helicopter as well and, uh, and some areas that I think we could streamline things as well. The, the helicopter um, came and flew over us and then flew away and we were all a little bit upset about that. We wanted it to come and land. I knew it went to Alta and it picked up, um, I believe someone from the forecast center and came back uh, and then overflew us again, and then finally landed, and then we were able to, um, you know, to carry Dave down and, and get him loaded on the helicopter. So one of our questions that, that we had is, you know, can, can this be made better as well? Is there a way, because, and, and I know that this is a really tough question, and so I hope no one interprets this as criticism in a bad form, but is there a way that we can communicate to the helicopter crew that it's safe to land rather than them having to go get someone else and come back and fly over and then land? Because um, that, that, that's something that takes time. Um, I think it was about 90 minutes or so before um, Dave actually was flown away. And I think as far as the statistics go, that's a really fast extraction. And so we all can be really thankful for that. But it certainly could have been even faster if we could have you know, eliminated one of those, one of those steps. The other thing that we noticed immediately was that the helicopter didn't have a, any sort of method for transporting the victim to the helicopter. So this is one of those lucky things. Dave was lucky in that he went full track and was clear at the bottom. So we didn't have to drag him too far. What we ended up doing is using a small emergency, one of those little mylar um, emergency blankets and kind of half carry, half drag him uh, down to the helicopter. It was lucky that there was enough of us, and it was lucky that we were close enough to the bottom that this was actually feasible. Had Dave been buried partway up the track, it would have been a total nightmare. And the helicopter didn't have any sort of, uh, we you know, expected a backboard or something, some sort of stretcher. There was no, no method of transportation to get him on the helicopter. So we were thinking, you know, why is that? You know, is it a weight thing? Is it a space thing? And just in our few minutes of brainstorming at lunch the other day, we were thinking, man, you know, we got these cool BCA airbags back there, right? You could have a sweet airbag sled uh, or an airbag backboard. Or, you know, we have these awesome, uh, you know, black diamond carbon fiber poles that weigh hardly anything. Could we have a, a carbon fiber foldable set of poles and a, you know, a really lightweight Cuban fiber stretcher, some, something along those lines. So anyway, they definitely needed a way to, um, to move the victim um, that wasn't just totally improvised because, you know, had it just been their party, there wouldn't have been enough people to actually do it or we would have had the pilot out, you know, <laughs> helping to drag and that would have been uh, really tough as well. Um, so. Some, some observations is that um, of, of things that I noticed, um, it was actually really worked out really well. One of the lucky things was just how good our group cooperated together. I pretty much noticed that there wasn't even a lot of communication necessary between our group members and it was largely seemed to be kind of nonverbal and self-coordinating. As people came into the avalanche scene, they all kind of basically fell into doing what needed to be done. And I think that's a result of every single person that was in that party had been trained in avalanche rescue at some point, at, in some capacity. So people knew to turn off their beacons, people knew or put their beacons in receive, people knew to get their shovels out, people just started in um, digging. Someone, you know, 
got their phone out and started to make the calls, and so everything was really well, went really well, and uh, um, that was awesome and, and really lucky. Um, it could have been much worse had, a, had the group not had that kind of uh, reaction and, and training. Uh, it was a really fast recovery. It felt slow to us, but compared to average recovery times, it was great. Um, the group on site is, is critical. Uh, you know, I put in there, choose your friends wisely. Um, if, if something happens, um, you know, you're reliant on the people right there on the ground with you um, to, to dig you out. And so your group is really, really important. If you're going out and skiing with a group um, that you don't know well or you're skiing with people that are new, um, and it's really important to have some, some veterans in there as well and to have some practice. Um, and then, you know, communication needs to be, um, you know, Im improved so that we can uh, do this well. I was actually involved in a rescue scenario this summer uh, coming down Bells Canyon. Uh, we came across this old guy who had been lost all day long and we had seen the helicopter up there flying around looking for him on our way down. And uh, so I got to spend a little time on the phone um, with the the Unified Police uh, Dispatcher in 911, and I was really, really impressed with um, the way that that went. They were able to know exactly where I was from my iPhone. Um, the GPS in my phone was able to be used by the dispatcher, uh, and they were able to use uh, a map to pinpoint, and I was able to tell them based on a climbing route where I was, and they were able to know that. And I know now, um, that the dispatchers, at least I believe now, have access to the Wasatch backcountry map so we can tell them the names of our slide paths and things like that. So uh, I think that we actually are in a, a really good situation for that where that can, um, is effective and continue, uh, can continue to be um, improved. And so, um, Like I said, Dave, Dave was, was really lucky. So what, what can we do to take some of the luck out of it? Um, I have one, one minute to finish up. And so um, one of the things that I think really needs to always be hammered home for everybody that goes out and skis um, is the, the social aspect of the decision making when it goes into it, right? Um, and, and, you know, Dave said he wasn't we wasn't feeling it like you know jaws like really are we going to ski that today well you know we were up there that same day and i don't think it crossed any of our minds um to ski that and so we need to basically work with our own group of friends with our own uh ski partners to have that level of confidence and trust in one another that we can um we can say no to skiing thing skiing a run without feeling pressured into it and without, you know, being belittled or made fun of by our friends. We, we belittle and make fun of our friends for lots of things, right? And that's okay, that's part of friendship, but not for ski decisions. And um, for me, having, you know, been involved in a, um, a rescue in the past, that actually became a lot easier because I was able to just say, you know what, like, I've dug someone out before and it's not worth it, you know. Tomorrow's Christmas, like, let's, let's just ski something mellow and go home. Um, we need to be able to say that <clears throat> all the time to the people that we're skiing with. And if we can't, we need to be reevaluating our friendships, right? Because our lives and the people depending on us at home are much more important than, than getting a ski line done. And so um, at the end of the day, um, we can take luck out of it by, you know, doing our best to make good decisions, to not be afraid to not ski something, to ski with people who are... Um, trained, who are experienced, and um, and then we still maybe need to get a little uh, luck at the end of the day. But uh, it it ended well, and hopefully we can all learn from it and uh, live to ski another day. And uh, that's it. Thanks. <laughs>